Previously on Chairside Live, I discussed important reasons to implement dental photography into your practice. Moving forward with that theme today, I'd like to review some of the most common errors that I see doctors and staff making with chairside photography and give some helpful hints on how to minimize or avoid struggling with acquiring professional photos and help it become an easy, streamlined process. There are so many videos, tutorials, articles, and opinions on the topic of dental photography, so I'm going to focus this presentation on the basic fundamentals to allow you, the viewer, to modify them to fit your own practice needs. Before even picking up the camera and starting to shoot photos, it is important to first position your patient in a manner that will assist everyone involved in acquiring the correct angulation and the proper photo. Not only does this set us up for success, but it allows the patient to prepare for the session and to become involved. Instead of asking your patient to turn their head towards you, position the patient to take an image straight on with their body position in alignment with their head, preventing unnatural stretching or angling to compensate. Make micro adjustments to the patient's head positioning by tweaking the angles, tilting the chin up and down, and straightening the head to minimize the need to adjust photos later. If the head is still positioned on the headrest, slight adjustments to the chair allowing the patient to rest the head and make a steady base is advisable. For full face and profile photographs, plan a neutral colored spot near a wall where the patient can stand and face their body and head in alignment at all angles needed for the shots. Always ask your patient to face their entire body the direction that you want the head to be pointing to avoid an unnatural stretched appearance. Instead of using a black background for close-up smile photos, keep the camera set on your preferred extraoral image settings and move in close. The background will automatically go neutral or black and only your subject will come into focus. After patient positioning, angling the camera itself is the second most important step to acquire your desired photo outcome. For full smile shots, if the chin has been positioned looking too low and the camera is facing from an obtuse angle, then foreshortening of the smile is the most likely outcome, similar to overangulation of an x-ray film. Positioned too high, and a false reverse smile can appear. Along these same guidelines, lateral angulation will have the same adverse effect unless the camera is pointed as close to 90 degrees as possible to the subject teeth. Difficult to reach posterior intraoral shots can be aided with a clean intraoral mirror connected to a handle to retract the gingiva and reflect the subject area at a more direct angle, and then be flipped in post-production to give the illusion that the photo was taken without the distraction of the cheeks and lips. In all aspects of dentistry, we learn how to manage an inherently busy working field. Saliva, blood, condensation, and other contaminants, although native to the area, cause serious distractions for high-quality photo rendering. To remove extraoral distractions such as the lips, cheeks, and free gingiva, a multitude of different retraction devices are available to assist the photographer. Blockout devices, such as an intraoral contraster, may cut away even more distractions such as the tongue, throat, and shade variances while highlighting the subject area of the mouth and focusing the eyes towards them. These contrasters can be used with or without lip and cheek retraction as needed. Posterior shots may or may not need additional lighting depending on the quality of illumination from the camera flash. Test a couple images with and without additional outside light sources involved to find what works the best in each particular situation. Light reflecting off of the intraoral mirror may also cause distortions. Pay close attention to the focus of the external light beam and adjust accordingly to determine if light reflected off the mirror, direct illumination, or no external lighting at all will work the best. Intraoral mirrors are most susceptible to fogging from breath condensation. A mirror can be heated in water to minimize fog accumulation. However, I try to stay far away from this method simply because the water adds one more layer of distortion that I already don't need to work around. Instead, simply applying a steady air blast from an air water syringe will instantly defog the mirror and allow for a clear, reflected shot. If you are the only practitioner available, the use of an intraoral mirror with a handle is convenient to allow the patient to hold while you simultaneously defog the mirror and acquire the photo. Most times, when we ask a patient to perform a specific movement, maybe as simply as biting down into normal occlusion, the patient will attempt to overthink that action and smile or bite unnaturally. It is important to practice the specific actions that you are requesting with the patient 
and pay close attention to overzealous positions such as the protruding of the jaw, fake, stretched smiles meant to show the teeth rather than smile naturally, and the failure to bite completely into centric occlusion. Specifying exactly what is required in each step of the photography process and coaching the patient along the way will ultimately result in photos that can be used for marketing, education, and as legal documentation. A smile photo should always be taken with a natural smile in place. If the teeth are meant to be profiled more than a natural smile will allow, professional retraction devices need to be utilized instead of a forced lift of the lip or stretched appearance. Whether your photography is being used for marketing, education, documentation, or self-critique, the more you can make your photo stream complete, the more successful you will be in achieving these individual goals. I attempt to document my doctor's procedures from before treatment, shade, after preparation, stump shade, temporary stage, final seat, and the subsequent post-procedural checks. This data is also useful to explain the patient's individual treatment back to them and raise the value that the patient feels in their investment. To elaborate on this topic, photos that more closely match each other in succession will garner the most understanding of the procedure. The angulation, lighting, and surroundings need to be acquired as similar as possible in each photo. Any post-production, which may include flipping or cropping images, should also follow these rules. In conclusion, by combining all of the basics outlined in each of these photography steps, the final photography produced will naturally become consistent and complete without going out of the way to make it so.